Judges all set? Excellent. We thank the speaker for their speech and I'll call upon the first speaker of side opposition to deliver that. Hi, uh, can I be seen and heard? Thank you. I would prefer verbal POIs, so please unmute and ask. Proposition tries to clarify what this debate is about, but unfortunately doesn't do their basic job of characterizing state-owned enterprises. So I'm going to have to do their job for them. Let's be very clear where state-owned enterprises operate. First, the industries they operate in are not fields that require extensive innovation, like science or medicine. And that's because most governments know that companies are better equipped to do that especially developing nations where R&D is expensive. That's why most state-owned enterprises today exist in sectors like utilities and the airline industry, industries where needed technology and materials are already available. Crucially, these are also often industries with some potential for profit, but importantly have a strong connection to public welfare in the case of gas and electricity. What is our stance? We believe that developing countries should not privatize their state-owned enterprises. This means that governments are directly held responsible and seen as responsible for the actions of the enterprise. It could include whether people in rural parts of the country can, uh, can access electricity and whether flights are safe and affordable. Two arguments in this speech. First, state-owned enterprises avert market failure. Second, state-owned enterprises enable democratic trade-offs. My second speaker will explain how they increase corporate influence in politics. Before that, some rebuttal. First, on their model. They say, and this is their only caveat, they're going to regulate companies. First, they're very, very vague about what this regulation is. What exactly do they try to prevent? How are they going to enforce it? How much money are they going to put into this kind of regulation? They need to give us more detail, otherwise this caveat is meaningless for their case. But the fact that they included this caveat suggests that they know and they are scared of the fact that there's a risk of corporate exploitation. I will explain in my argument why regulation will inevitably fail to prevent that. But just note that their POI concession, that they're going to open the market up to foreign corporations, makes regulation infinitely harder on their side when foreign MNCs that are based elsewhere operate within your market and have huge financial clout. More on that in the argument. Second, and this is their first argument, they say state-owned enterprises cannot be declared bankrupt and therefore they're highly inefficient because they'll be bailed out by states, whereas competition between private companies lowers costs. First, the fixed costs of many of these industries are high. For instance, running an electrical grid involves an enormous amount of costs that no company would take up unless they're guaranteed access to the whole market. They thus can't have multiple companies competing because the costs are so high that no company will enter it Otherwise, second, states have incentives to avoid running up high debts because this would be political suicide because it means the tab must be picked up by voters and as well, uh, and, and uh, generally there's huge concern about debt in many governments. Finally, next they say, governments are short-termist which will lead to poor business decisions. This is uncomparative. Shareholders are far more short-termist because they want to maximize returns in the immediate term because guess what? Putting your money in a foreign investment is extremely risky the longer it takes for you to make that return back. That's why the incentive for them to develop in the long term is minimal. Comparatively, governments and parties still want to stay around in the medium to long term, and they want to take credit for, uh, for long-term projects by cashing in on this at future elections. So this argument is just uncomparative. Finally, they give us a very quick argument or, or, or claim on corruption. And, and how this undermines the efficacy of our policy. This hurts their own counterfactual of implementing regulations and it cuts both ways. If governments are corrupt, how exactly are they going to effectively implement regulations POI. in their world? This argument or, or this attempt to take out our case simply doesn't work. Before I move on to the case, yeah. Which world would have better development that is more stable? A world in which this development is continuously changed according to the different political interests of each incumbent party at each stage of government? Sorry, or I, I, one? I just explained why governments have some incentive to stick around the medium term and therefore they're not going to be as short term as, as you say. First argument, state-owned enterprises avert market failure. 
The premise is that in many of these markets, the price of the goods provided have immense implications on people and the economy. The price of electricity in Nigeria not only directly determines how many households are able to afford fridges and air conditioning in the sweltering Lagos summer, it also directly determines the operating costs of factories across the entire economy and the amount of foreign investment that flows in. Crucially, private corporations have no incentive to care about these externalities because by definition, they're profit maximizing entities. They're answerable primarily to the private shareholders that care solely about the immediate return on their investment. I know Proposition tried to regulate these companies. The problem is that developing nations will have no ability to do this when they surrender control to private firms, when private corporations now literally control your electricity and water supply these governments are unlikely to have much bargaining power at the negotiating table, especially because, as their POI concedes, they want to let in foreign firms. On the comparative, governments across the spectrum have a far greater incentive to care about the welfare of citizens and the economy. First, because the vast majority of developing nations are democracies. They might not be perfect ones. Elections may not be perfect and courts may be weak. But we think even the weakest of democracies are forced to limit prices because unaffordable water or electricity is a surefire way to anger every family and every corporation. Second, even in authoritarian regimes or corrupt regimes, states still need to maintain performance legitimacy because these strongman leaders often justify their curtailment of democratic liberties by promising economic growth. This means that they still need to keep these goods affordable for the sake of the economy. We're not saying that state-owned enterprises will make a loss, but what we are saying is that they won't pursue profit at all else. It means utility prices will be kept generally affordable. It means they expand electricity access to rural villages, even if it's unprofitable. We protect citizens and the economy as a whole. Second argument, state-owned enterprises enable democratic trade-offs. The premise is that unlike a corporation whose profits line the pockets of CEOs and shareholders, the revenue received by state-owned companies goes into state coffers, which states use to provide public services. Crucially, state-owned companies are uniquely a very important source of revenue because they're incredibly flexible. Since governments can tweak uh, uh, prices, like for instance, lowering QI. prices for goods and increasing funding for other public uh, services. It looks like states in the middle of a healthcare crisis charging more for airline tickets so they can have more money to build more hospitals. Conversely, it can also look like states lowering water prices in order to attempt uh, to, to increase industrial production in factories. The reason why this flexibility is so important is no such thing as an objectively correct economic trade-off. There is no inherent reason why the building of hospitals is more important than charging lower electricity prices, nor is there a reason why the converse is true. The only way we prioritize this is when people collectively decide by the ballot box that one outcome is more valuable than the other. Given that the state is accountable to public opinion through the vote, they're in the best position to make this trade-off. Therefore, this substantive takes them at their best. Because even if they can prove that co companies run these uh, services better and provide a higher quality of services, they don't prove that this is an important outcome. Because people were never allowed to choose and decide for themselves as to whether they wanted to prioritize low electricity prices or more accessible housing or better health care. Uh, even if it means higher prices. So it's uniquely state-owned enterprises that were able to represent and protect societal interests across the board. For all those reasons, we are very proud to oppose. Thank you. Judges all set. Excellent. We thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the second speaker, Team Proposition, over there. Hi, can I be clearly heard? Okay.
the context of this debate is that state-owned enterprises in developing countries have failed. In the vast majority of developing countries, state-owned enterprises operate at substantial deficits. They're massively inefficient and the quality of products has dropped. That is the reason why countries like Argentina launched a major privatization program that included the privatization of its telephone monopoly and national airline with similar efforts in countries like Chile as well. Notice how there's no example whatsoever in the speaker before me. So it's funny that they bring in comparatives about why prices are so limited and in authoritarian states, they promise economic growth. So that's the reason why state-owned ent enterprises will work. Team Singapore is unfortunately not in touch with reality. Two areas of reputation then, everything will be integrated. Number one, on do we get better effectiveness of these enterprises through privatization? The most urgent goal in the debate is efficiency and the effectiveness of enterprises insofar as uplifting the lives of individuals is the most pressing issue in developing countries, know how they don't contest this. First thing then to note at the top is that the inefficiency of state-owned enterprises in developing countries is not a joke. Like it literally takes up 50% of debt in these countries. They can't assert that governments I'm avoid this. Well, thanks. Political suicide in the chat, by the way, when this is status quo. Let's then talk about structural reasons as to why this is true. I'll be adding to what Warwick told you. Number one, because there is no competition whatsoever when this is a state-owned monopoly. The moment at which it becomes privatized, that means that companies are forced to manufacture higher quality products at lower prices, and they compete on the basis of how effectively they distribute these utilities. The only thing they say to this is that companies will never like enter this industry on our side because the costs are way too much and the barrier of entry is too high. In the same breath, however, they themselves make a clarification that this debate is about utilities where the materials are already there. So presumably, the barrier of entry isn't massive to that degree where no companies can enter insofar as these are like, not like medical fields or things like that. I think there's definitely tension over there. But two, there is an explicit profit incentive on our side. State-owned enterprises and its workers don't share any of the profits that you make, whereas private firms must make a profit, so it is likely to cut out on costs as much as possible and prioritize efficiency. That is the reason why all state-owned enterprises in developing countries showed major improvements after switching to privatization. No response whatsoever to the fact that privatization is factually more efficient. Thirdly, private firms have pressures from shareholders, which means they must perform efficiently. And also further note that if the firm is inefficient, then the firm could be subject to a takeover, which is the worst thing that could happen. State-owned firms on their side don't have that type of pressure, which means it is far easier for them to fall into the trap of inefficiency. What we get in response is that private companies just don't care about externalities, and that leads to really bad policies. I think this is factually wrong. Private companies depend on their ability to earn money. They cannot operate without listening to the regulation of the government. So being profit-seeking, they need to retain their market and not get shut out. But we get, uh, and then we get this idea like charging more for airline tickets is like more important than putting value into a hospital. Number one, I think they completely just threw out consumer choice insofar as private corporations allow free choice for the consumer. I think there's far more incentives for private companies to do that as far as that is the best way to ensure that they make profit and the market is efficient. But number two, we tell you private corporations want to make money. So it is unlikely that they increase prices so high that no one can access it. But moreover, even if it's true that they do things like price gouging, I think that is the point at which new companies can enter as far as like, uh, like if prices are so high, then more, more companies can compete against that. But number three, things like taxes exist as well. Those are the types of regulations we're talking about. No response to that. That. Before I move on, I'll take that POI. How easy is it for a company to enter an electricity market where you need to have huge amounts of startup capital so you can do things like renovate a massive electricity grid? Number one, I think, like, first of all, I think you're taking us at our very worst, but more than that, the comparative on your side is that this is just a state-owned industry. Insofar as what we're doing is we are privatizing the company, state-owned companies that already exist in the very worst case. Like that is status quo. I think, at, I think in our case, what happens is that you allow the opportunities for more private companies to come in. Our argument is that that is a net at good at like at best your PI doesn't prove that things get any better on your side of the house I think there's no net benefit on your side but secondly is the government a good actor and know how the previous speaker like the speaker for me ignores the entirety of our claim here there are a number of issues we told you when you allow the government to control the state-owned enterprises number one we told you the government's primary purpose and goal is to engage in politics which means that on their incentives they themselves point out that governments are short-termists what does that actually mean they're unwilling to invest in long-term projects that are 
beneficial for the country insofar as they know that they will not be the party to reap the benefits of that long-term plan when a new party comes into place. On the comparative, private industries are likely to wait for the long-term where they maximize the returns. That is why profit incentive is good. We told you that government also has different incentives. It looks like having more government workers because it's good for the uh, because it's like good for the reputation if they have more jobs in the economy when that comes at the cost of the national budget and overall economic efficiency, which is a structural reason as to why companies or as to why the government cannot be efficient on their side. Secondly, we told you that governments are factually and fundamentally slower than private companies for all the reasons we gave you. Number three, given that this is a developing country and the characterization in the majority of these cases is that it's ridden with corruption and cronyism, which is why these industries were so inefficient when it was state-owned. That means it's fundamentally inefficient. But secondly, even if it's not, you rely on the competence of the current government for state-owned enterprises, which is fundamentally unnecessary and problematic. Fourth, we told you there's no competition at all. So if the POI is that it's difficult to enter these industries, insofar as we allow the opportunity for, for companies to have that in the first place, and that is far better on our side. Five, because governments can deflect this blame. Like they can say, look, this is the only method we can use. There are no other alternatives. I have no idea how there's any accountability on their side that keeps governments accountable. This is the reason why countries like Brazil, Turkey, Malaysia, Philippines, all have privatized their electronic manufacturing firms, which by the way, addresses their POI and things like food processing plants. They can make up a magical reality and say that this can happen. They've seen massive improvements in efficiency. Government is a uniquely bad actor to do this. No response to that. Moving on to our third argument, as to why ethnic minorities in developing countries aren't benefited through the motion. The nature of state-owned companies is that government oversees all its operations and they work based on the opinion of the government. Status quo reflects obviously that the majority of developing countries have a lot of ethnic minorities are like divided on like deep lines. So this is countries like Malaysia and Sri Lanka. Why is it problematic? Many developing countries' governments are biased against these minorities and actively act to persecute them. Note that SOEs give them an active leeway and opportunity to persecute them and abuse them by making access to these resources that these companies provide scarce to those minorities and the enclaves they live in. Why is this solved if it is privatized? Number one, because private companies are no longer motivated by the political interests of the government to, perse to persecute those minorities, but by the prospect of greater consumers and money. Two, therefore, they have far less of a reason to discriminate against minorities because they are still the same consumers under their judgment, whereas there are different considerations that the government takes into account. Why then is this round winning? Number one, because these minorities are the most vulnerable stakeholders in this debate. But secondly, we give them greater access to resources like electricity, water, etc., by removing any chance of government bias from their accessibility, whereas they have no mechanism to ensure that abuse doesn't happen on their side. What we need from the next speaker of Singapore and completely failed to get in the first is firstly, a defense of why it is legitimate to hand this power to the government when we've proven the, all the massive inefficiencies that happen on their side. But secondly, prove why they're against the current trend of privatization and why the benefits that we see in status quo don't actually exist. We're very happy to propose. Thank you. Judges all set. Excellent. We thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the second speaker side opposition to deliver things. Um, hi, could I just check if I'm audible and visible? Okay, thank you. I think it's time that we peel back the euphemisms of efficiencies that their side wants to create. Because you know what that looks like? That looks like private companies buying over rail lines, then charging exorbitant prices, like we saw in Argentina, and therefore extracting money from the most vulnerable individuals. It looks like them maximizing their own short-term corporate interests. So every time they say you know, they want more efficiency, that's often exploitative for the most vulnerable people in their world. At the top of this speech, I just want to clear up three things. First, 
on this ar new argument about minorities. Like, I just want to point out here, if it's true that the state is actively discriminatory against minorities, then surely if they support regulations, the state can impose unfair regulations that says that, for instance, only supply electricity towards this area where the minority doesn't live in, right? So obviously, if the state is discriminatory against minorities, this is a non-issue, and therefore I really don't want to hear them talk about this again. More than that, this also applies to the issue of corruption. If it's true that the state is corrupt, why would they regulate these companies in a fair way? Why won't they engage in excessive cronyism on your side of the house as well. I think that in this debate, we have to assume that to some extent, states do want to benefit their individuals. And I'm going to explain, why, explain to you why we get the better on the outside of the house. With that, I want to talk about two areas of clash here. First, on the incentives of governments versus companies. And secondly, on our unique weighing mechanism on economic development. First, on the incentive of governments versus companies. The first thing they said here is about short-termism. And I just want to be very clear about the comparative in this debate. The comparative here is this. In their world, it is private firms beholden to shareholder interests that are even more short-termist. And the structural reason for why these actors are more short-termist is because they don't care about public perception. They don't care about the fact that they may try to jack up prices to extract immediate profits. For example, people will rise up against them because they are not beholden to the vote on their side of the house. That is the structural reason for why on their side it's more likely that they're going to be more short-termist. Contrast this to governments, where yes, maybe they have four-year election cycles, but it's precisely because of this that they want to implement long-term projects because that is where you can tell voters, keep voting for me because I promise you this long-term project and I can continue doing this and uh, in the future years, for example. That is why it's precisely governments, even on our worst case, to be comparatively more long-termist. So their own argument is flipped. Next, they talk about accountability and how they can have regulations on companies. First, we already pointed out how regulations just don't work because of the massive corporate influence, especially within large MNCs that they just cannot mitigate on their side of the house. Secondly, even if on their best case, regulations do exist, firms can still engage in predatory actions in response to these regulations. For example, if you have a regulation that says to cap prices at a certain level, then what firms will just do is reduce their output so as to maximize their profit. And what this, this just means is that there's more harms caused on your side of the house when at the point in which people get less electricity and less water, for example, when they just reduce their output to maximize their profit. Comparatively, we think governments aren't inherently profit maximizing like they concede. And that is why they're more willing to charge lower prices while maintaining the same level of output to ensure that people can access this. That's why this comparative logic was missed on their side of the house. Third, on efficiency. I want to be clear here. What are the different mechanisms that both sides support for efficiency? On our side, the mechanism for efficiency is the vote because people pressure the government to be efficient because people dislike their firms going bankrupt generally. On their side, the mechanism here is competition to increase the quality of service. I'm going to compare these two mechanisms to explain why the vote is a preferable one. And here's the reason for this, because when it comes to these private markets, firstly, it is incredibly difficult for new entrants to emerge. For example, look at the electricity market, where often, yes, it is true that there's existing infrastructure, but there are also very high fixed costs associated with just maintaining it or developing new infrastructure or improving the quality of service. Like, obviously, when you improve the quality of service on your side, that also entails a large, significant financial investment. That is why it's incredibly difficult for new entrants to enter the industry. But more than that, often, SOEs often operate within industries that are naturally monopolistic. What do I mean by this? Often, they divide areas into each of their domains. So for example, let's say you have a Wi-Fi company, you just divide one part of the village towards your Wi-Fi company and another part of the village to another Wi-Fi company. This is literally what happens in the US, for example, with AT&T. And, and like, if we think if, if this can happen in the developed world, it's even more likely that it will happen in the developing world on their side of the house. That is why these industries are naturally monopolistic and they can just can't kind of bang on competition existing. Comparatively, we think that on our side of the house, people are going to pressure the government for all the structural reasons we gave you in the first speaker, why they can hold the government accountable. We think that's a far more preferable mechanism. Before I move on, I'll take that POI. Your web speaker asked a POI about how it is easy for private, how it's hard for private companies to enter electronic manufacturing industry without realizing it's been done in Brazil, Turkey, Malaysia with massive improvements in efficiency. Why is that bad? Um, yes. Um, so if you really want to talk about examples, yes, on your best case, let's say they enter these industries. We think it often looks like just jacking up prices to make an immediate return on investment, like I talked about. Like in the United Kingdom, for example, where literally the, uh, privatizing that industry just led to an increase in cost of 2.7 billion. Or in Guinea, for example, in 1989, where we saw rises in electricity about six to seven times because of this privatization. So if you want to talk about examples, there are many more to demonstrate to you why this actively hurt the poor on your side of the house. Finally, here about innovation. 
we've already explained to you why innovation is unlikely to happen. And the reason for this is because when companies are owning these industries, they have no incentive to innovate to improve the quality of lives of people on the ground. That is the government's incentive because the people are likely to vote on the government. Comparatively, what a company will do is to maximize efficiency by, for instance, jacking up prices because often it's a very good way because the demand for these goods are often very inelastic. Things that are often basic necessities like electricity, for example, makes it very easy for the government to jack up prices just to extract uh, for companies to jack up prices just to extract money from individuals. So that is why that comparative here is just far worse and causes more harm for people. <laughs> Finally, I want to explain to you our weighing mechanism of economic development. Thus far, the entire case is premised on this assumption that there's this objective, correct economic trade-off that we can make in a debate. Our point is that there is no objective economic good, and the way to determine economic trade-offs is up to people. For instance, the trade-off between should we decrease prices for electricity, for example, or take that money to fund hospitals, for example, right? These are economic trade-offs that only people on the ground can make. And we think that we can only make these trade-offs on outside of the house when these are owned by the government, because then they can decide where the revenue goes to, whether they should increase or decrease prices and where money flows to. That is why this weighing mechanism proves that even on their own metric of economic development, we win because we fulfill the interests of people. Finally, I'm going to give you my substantive argument on giving a further reason for why the state is beholden to corporate interests on your side of the house. There are two reasons for this. First, because often these companies control the economic lifeline of developing countries. Think about it. You are literally giving control of your electricity, your water, your transport system, all towards these private companies. Second, often these industries operate within natural monopolies with high fixed costs. As a result, this often cements private monopolies with concentrated power within these industries. Note, what is the strategic value of this argument? First, this demonstrates to you why on their side of the house, there's going to be overwhelming control and lobbying power over governments at the point in which when you entrust these crucial national industries in the hands of private actors who only care about their own profit incentive. This means that this A, undermines their own mechanism on regulations because it means that it's only on their side where in the long term, regulations are eroded and therefore all of the harms are just going to be far worse. But secondly, it further demonstrates to you why it's very difficult to regulate companies and what it's going to result in is going to be the exploitative treatment of individuals. Apparently, we concede governments may not be the most perfect actors, but at least people vote for governments. At least people can tell governments what to do and be angry at governments when they mess up. Comparatively, companies don't have to listen to the voices of individuals on the ground. And we think that this policy only gives them greater capacity to ignore what people are saying, to just go straight to the government and just extract concessions from the government. Like telling the government to roll back labor regulations and the government having no choice but to capitulate because they just literally control the whole industry and the lifelines of the competition. At the end of this speech, we made three things very clear. First, when it came to incentives, governments are far better. Secondly, we explain how the governments have better ability to make economic trade-offs. And thirdly, we think that often they increase the power of companies in the long term and increase reliance in an incredibly top. All of these reasons, I've never been prouder to oppose. Thank you. Uh, could I possibly ask for all speakers to have their cameras on throughout the debate, unless there is some uh, internet-related reason for you to turn them off? Uh, thank you. Also, are our judges all set? Cool. In that case, I thank the second speaker of opposition for their speech and call on the third speaker of proposition to deliver theirs. Thank you. Before I begin, just reiterating that I would prefer POIs verbally. Judge, the opposition only takes themselves in their very best case without considering the nuances of the status quo, like the bias in many developing countries against ethnic minorities and their inability to dictate companies efficiently. So we will just take them at their best and show you why we still win this debate. Before I go on into a few very important voting points, couple of burdens. The opposition's burdens were twofold. Firstly, they had to they had to justify why state-owned companies would be the most efficient in boosting production and economic stimulation. And secondly, they had to justify the possibility of government corruption and undue influence in SOEs and why their benefits outweigh this harm. So 
With this said, let's move on into the three major voting, voting points. Firstly, who gets faster development? Secondly, who gets more sustainable development? And finally, third, who best helps these ethnic minorities? These are the most important voting points of today because the first deals with the urgency of the well-being of these developing states. Secondly, the necessity for them to have a sustained way of life and economy. And th the third one deals with the most vulnerable actors in today's debate. Moving on. The first point on faster development. Let's talk about increasing competition by lowering the bar of entry into industries. This is what we said point is going to happen under our side insofar as we are able to not have state-owned enterprises that are able to monopolize through having a contract with the government all the resources in their industry and thereby increasing the bar of entry for other industries so that there are no other industries capable companies capable of entering this industry. The opposition then said that costs are so high for these industries so that companies wouldn't enter anyway under both sides. But like our second speaker said, they also said that it's about utilities. So it's not about massive development. So they contradict themselves. The reason why costs are high under the gov under the opposition case is because SOEs are in this contract that allows the government to give them monopoly over these resources because they are state owned. There was no response to this. And so this proves why our mechanism works in allowing more industries, to, uh, more companies to come into these industries. This is crucial because then we increase competition. So we have better production and better, uh, better quality of production. And we have like more economic stimulation at the end of the day, but we also then create more jobs for people and therefore increase their economic livelihoods as well. Now, the second point under this um, clash is that the government is an inefficient actor, especially given the status quo, because a lot of developing countries are in a state of chaos, or like they said, unstable democracies. And so they are not the most efficient actor to dictate the way that companies move, for example. And there was no response to this. So all in all, this, like, this clash ends in our win, in that we get more faster development that is also more efficient at the end of the day. Before we go on into the second point, I'll take a POI. So why would companies have any incentive to innovate to improve the quality of lives of the people on the ground when their real incentive is to make more money, which often means increasing prices for people? Because of the competition that I just explained to you, please engage. Secondly, the second most important point is on sustainable development. A few points under this. Firstly, let's talk about government corruption because this was a very messy point in this debate. I'm gonna talk about two possible scenarios. Firstly, what happens if governments are corrupt? But secondly, what happens if governments are not corrupt? Let's talk about the first possibility. If governments are corrupt, then we think that the problem is not government regulation of companies, but the corrupt nature of the government itself in that if these if this these corrupt governments own state-owned enterprises, they would siphon money from these companies for their own greed and therefore also slow down the progress of companies. At least on our side, if the government is corrupt, we keep these businesses open and functioning. The opposition had no response to this kind of possibility. But secondly, let's talk about if governments are not corrupt. The opposition said that under our side, then this kind of not corrupt government could not regulate companies. This is wrong because private companies depend on their ability to earn money. They cannot operate without listening to the regulation of the government. Being profit-seeking, they need to retain their market and not get shut out. But then the opposition try to say, in their best case, then companies can just reduce their output to maximize profit. Number one, this is not our best case. You're just trying to say that and then impact what would happen if governments can't regulate, which is our worst case. But we already told you why they can. But secondly, additionally, companies have an incentive to regulate themselves uniquely under our case. Because one, we increase competition between domestic companies and two, to foreign companies and markets will come in and compete with them as said under your side. This means that if they don't regulate themselves, consumers will just go buy from these other companies and they will lose their profit. Then this point of regulation is a wash at best on both sides. That's weighed out by the impacts that we gave you in the first clash in our favor. But moving on to the second point under this clash, removing political influence because the incumbent party would not invest in macro related like businesses. The opposition said that shareholders are much more short termist, but this is wrong because they care about the money that they can make, but investments are almost never short termist. They care about the quantity of profits, which means that they are willing to wait for the long term. But on their comparative, governments have different goals. So it's obvious that even if they do invest in macro related projects 
in their best case. It's never sustained because each party is going to just try to counteract the other's macro investment because they want to seem like they're better than the other party so that they can sustain their power or whatever. And there was no engagement to this. The third point is that the opposition talked about how SOEs are a unique source of income. Two uh, layers of response. Firstly, this unique source of income is not as great as it could be because we still get lots of income on our side because the government can tax industries. And also we provide for greater competition because we lower the entry bar to industries. So we also have more income insofar as we can tax more companies in the same industry. But two, in their best case, if these SOEs do line the government coffers as they say they do, they themselves admit then why companies would have no incentive to invest a lot in their progress or to try really hard to develop better technology because none of the money goes to them and their companies are monetarily motivated. The, next, the final layer of point under this clash is that the opposition said people can vote to get the government to invest in what they want. This is non-comparative because we both have a government where people can vote to get the government to invest in what they want. The problem is, is where these governments get this investment money. And we just proved to you, I just proved to you right now that we actually get more income on our side. So what do you get at the end of this second clash is that because we've um, proven all of these mechanisms, we get like more people having more jobs, we get more investment into like the sources that actually need investment. Um, and we remove political influence from like these companies so we get better macro development at the end of the day. Then what is the last important point? Ethnic minorities in these countries. We said that we remove government influence and bias and that the company and um, that could persecute against these ethnic minorities. The opposition said, insofar as foreign companies come in, they have no incentive to care about minorities. It's not that they care. It's that they don't care about what ethnicity their consumers are. Because companies are monetarily motivated, they don't care what ethnicity their consumers are as long as they are their consumers. So they have the monetary incentive to cater to everyone indiscriminate of who they are. And the opposition said, governments can still discriminate through regulations. Number one, this is wrong. You cannot discriminate through regulations because the government depends on the satisfaction of the public. Note that foreign MNCs and public companies would probably not invest if the government just sets regulations so they can't earn maximum profits. But two, even if we say that regulations do discriminate, the private company is able to effectively lobby against the government to allow them to offer their services to the ethnic minorities because they have the monetary incentive to do so. Because we are able to firstly ensure faster development, secondly ensure sustainable development, and finally be able to ensure the well-being of the most vulnerable ethnic minorities, we are more than proud to propose. Thank you. Judges all set. Cool. We thank the speaker for their speech and now call upon the third speaker of said opposition to deliver their speech. Hi, my audible invisible. Thank you. I want to make a few observations before I go any further. First, all of the benefits about lower prices and greater efficiency are predicated on one mechanism, that there is more competition in their world. If I show you that we have taken this out, which we have, and if I show you that they have not responded to what we've told you from the beginning of this debate, this mechanism, they cannot claim any of these benefits. Next, I want to be clear about how this clash on regulations has gone and why it's important. We gave you structural reasons for why they could not have regulations in their world. We point out companies can often lobby to repeal this. And our entire second speaker argument was about how they gave companies so much influence when they let them control important industries, for example, like electricity, like gas. No response. Second, we took them at their best here. So don't let the speaker say we didn't do that. We pointed out that regulations always have unintended consequences because companies always want to maximize profit. We gave you the example of a price ceiling where, for example, if they said there's a cap on prices, you are still going to have the unintended consequence of a company then producing less of that thing because they still want to maximize profit. Note that the comparative is very important here because government industries don't want to maximize profit. Maybe they want to make some of their money back, but they don't want to maximize profit at all costs. Meaning, on our side of the house, in this comparative, we can get the best of both worlds. Governments can often lower prices and at the same time still produce a relatively large amount of output. So this is important. Regulations are still comparatively worse under our side of the house, even if they can have them. So this is not a panacea that will save that case. Last, I want to clarify this important thing on minorities. At this point, the third speaker concedes. She says, ah, 
can governments, can corporations basically lobby governments? So I want to note that this is a huge concession that they made that corporations are going to be able to influence. Even then, I want to point out the huge problem with this claim of minorities. They've hung it on the very strange assumption that there's profit to be made by expanding to providing resources to minorities. Based on their own characterization, this appears to be contradictory. They say these are the poorest people, the most rural, the most disenfranchised. Based on their own characterization, surely it is not profitable to provide them either. So the third speaker contradicts by this point, because surely according to their own characterization, they are so poor they can't afford these goods. With that in mind, I'm going to ask two questions. First, on democratic trade-offs. Second, on the incentives of companies and governments. First, on democratic trade-offs. I want to be clear that they have not engaged with what we have told you from the beginning in this round. I'm going to take them at their very highest tier. Something they said they would do for us, but they notably didn't do. Let's say they get all of their benefits. Let's say private companies are much more efficient in their work. Let's say they get lower prices. Let's ask ourselves an important question. Why is any of this actually inherently good? When you think about it, there is no inherent reason. This is because there's no inherent reason why we value one thing over another. When we ask people to make subjective trade-offs, for example, to choose between better healthcare, for instance, and lower prices, there's no inherent way to weigh this up. The only way to do so is to ask people on the ground, which is why we have democracy. The reason we have democracy and the reason we let people vote is because we recognize that given that no one thing is inherently more important than the other, the only way to adjudicate its value is to let people decide. So let's be clear. Even on outside of the house, if things are less efficient, the reason our claim, our case outweighs theirs is because we still give people choice. We let them choose between different things. Even if, for example, we, the, the, there's some money lost in our world, at least we let them choose between what they want this company to do and what they want the government to do with the revenue it receives. Right? It means in the long term, for example, in a time of a stringent health crisis, people on outside of the house can vote for example, or at least support governments that would increase electricity prices, where they could use this funding to build more hospitals. At least on the outside of the house, if it's an education crisis, you can increase the prices perhaps of your walking to build more houses or to, to, to build more schools, for instance. These are all important things that they cannot co-opt under their side of the house. Because in their world, when the government does not own this industry in the long term, they cannot uniquely use these state-owned corporations as vehicles by which to make important democratic trade-offs because they just don't have enough money in the long term. Have that kind of flexibility. So this is strategically very important. Even if we lose on this efficiency clash, what I've demonstrated is that insofar as there are many other instances, whether it might be a health crisis, whether it's an education crisis, there's a housing crisis, insofar as there are many other instances in which people prioritize other things, we win because they can use these state-owned corporations as a vehicle to achieve that. And by definition, people find that thing to be more important. I'm now going to move on to the second clash on the incentives of companies and governments. I'm going to be a lot less charitable. Yeah, I... I'm going to take, take out their case. Before I go any further, sure, I'll take the point. In the case where ethnic minorities are obviously washed out in terms of popular vote, for example, in deciding what these companies do in your best case, how are these state-owned companies going to be incentivized to cater to them? Based on your own characterization, you characterize elections as highly competitive under your side of the house. When you say one party gets displaced by other parties, if elections are highly competitive, there will be a swing group. So your own concession, your own characterization cuts you here. Now, let's talk about the incentives of companies and governments. Note, as I pointed out at the start, all of their, all of their benefits are predicated on one mechanism, that they have greater competition. Here is why they don't achieve this. We give you structural responses they did not deal with. First, on their side of the house, these are industries with high fixed costs. For example, the airline industry, where you must invest a lot in planes, meaning that you would only bother to enter at the point where the government guarantees you access to the whole market, meaning they don't let other actors, other corporate actors enter to compete with you. They say in third proposition, ah, but you're contradicting yourself. You concede that the infrastructure is already built. Yes, maybe the infrastructure is already built, but as my second speaker points out, Often, there are still huge fixed costs involved. You have to renovate and maintain this over long periods of time. You, for example, have to expand because this infrastructure, while it might be built, is not perfect. As you concede, for example, electricity goods might not be fully built in all circumstances. So as you pointed out, there are still huge fixed costs inherent to entering the market. Second, my second speaker tells you about the problem of market segmentation. Even if there are instances where these fixed costs might not be as large, corporations often have strong incentives to warn governments to segment markets. He tells you about the Wi-Fi market, where, for example, certain service providers are designated specific areas. We've given you two structural reasons that they did not want to deal with. This is very important because it means that none of their benefits of competition can arise. So they cannot claim lower prices, they cannot claim more innovation. Because in their world, corporations basically become monopolies. This is very important because our entire first argument proved to you 
why this was a bad thing. It means they can charge very high prices. It means they have very little incentive to want to innovate in the first place because they already have designated control of this market. So all of this is very important because it proves that under their side of the house, there are huge problems. This means high prices can choke out the entire economy when electricity is unaffordable. It means many, many people on the ground go without heating in the winter. These are relevant harms we told you about that they did not deal with. Comparatively, we explain why democratic incentives were far better. First, democratic incentives means that state-owned enterprises don't want to maximize profit at all costs. So for example, they can still make their money back, but they're not going to want to charge sky-high prices all the time when, when they know people are desperate because they will lose them an election, for example. So we say that's why under our side of the house, comparatively, we are far better on this note. We maximize people's welfare. We protect them. Additionally, this also takes out the analysis on bankruptcy and firms going bankrupt and high levels of debt. Because as we pointed out, to absolutely no response from their side of the house, people don't like it when they owe a lot of money. People don't like it when they're emiserated in debt, which that's hugely politically unpopular. So even then, that doesn't work. So even on that, I flipped all of the benefits at this point. The last thing I want to point out here is this entire short -term clash on short-termism, which third proposition basically just dropped. Third proposition, or third proposition ignored the fact that we pointed out that governments have far more of an incentive to be long-term than companies. They just assert companies often make long-term investments. We gave you structural reasons why this was not true, because often investing in the long-term could be very risky, which is why you often want to enter, make a very quick profit via everything we've told you about, about market segmentation, and then leave, or in fact, just stay there and continue reaping profits. We saw things like innovation, for example, and long-term innovation are very risky for these shareholders who prefer to make their money back now because they've already put their money in. No response to this structural analysis. Comparatively, we told you governments have far more of an incentive to be long-term because at the point where you begin a long-term policy, that is when voters are more likely to want to vote you in. If, for example, you promise to expand the electricity grid over the next 20 years, that is when voters are going to vote you in because they want to see these long-term benefits. They want to see them materialize. This is what second opposition told you under our side of the house as to why we get more long-term things than them because is often very popular at the ballot box. What have I demonstrated? First, they cannot run away from regulations, even if they have that, if you explain why we win. Second, their benefits are contingent on one mechanism which I've taken out. Third, governments have far better incentives than companies. And fourth, even if you don't believe in any of that, we win because of our weighing mechanism on democracy. Very proud to oppose. Thank you. Judges all set. Excellent. We thank the third speaker of side opposition and call for the opposition reply speaker to deliver their speech. Hi, uh, can I be seen and heard? Great, thank you. Let's look at the two worlds in this debate. From the get-go, Proposition's world was shrouded in confusion. They provided a two-word policy. They would privatize industries and they would regulate firms. We asked them from the start, what does this mean? How are they privatizing it? What regulations will they introduce? How exactly will they enforce them? They finally gave us a clarification after a POI. They said they would introduce foreign MNCs to compete. We had pointed out how this destroyed their ability to introduce any meaningful regulation. First, because foreign firms had a wealth of resources to engage in lobbying. Second, because they wield disproportionate negotiating power because they literally control your water and electricity supply. They can hold you hostage. Third proposition even concedes that companies can lobby the government. This is on top of Unhau's second speaker argument, because he explained how industries like electricity and water are natural monopolies because companies would never enter uh, otherwise because of high startup costs. In a last stage attempt to respond, Prop 3 calls it a contradiction. This shows they weren't listening because while they don't require extensive innovation to develop telephone wires as we explained in Op 1, it does require a lot of money to maintain and repair and even set up new telephone wires in rural areas. So it wasn't the contradiction they called it. And ultimately, their side was one that was built on a naive and uncomparative understanding of markets and actor incentives. They thought states were short-termist without recognizing that shareholders were far more short-termist because they need swift returns on their investments because it's incredibly risky to have to wait years before you can recoup those billions, uh, this, those millions of dollars. Comparatively, governments seek re-election through long-term projects, telling voters to support them so they can, can continue funding transportation infrastructure and execute their plan. 
They thought that introducing competition was possible, refusing to respond to unhoused analysis about localized monopolies, how companies divide different regions amongst themselves with one company providing electricity or Wi-Fi to one specific area. They thought that efficiency meant quality improvements, disregarding the fact that firms are profit maximizing and efficiency means jacking up prices for price inelastic necessities like electricity. When proposition couldn't defend their initial vision of the world, their world devolved into a web of tense characterizations. They said states are going to be corrupt and therefore inefficient without realizing that governments that were corrupt and inefficient weren't going to successfully regulate firms anyway. They said states are going to prosecute minorities through state-owned enterprises, but they would suddenly regulate companies to make them cater to everyone because they care about public satisfaction, I quote third off. If that was the case, they would have to provide electricity to minorities using state-owned enterprises as well. They said it would be profitable to cater to everyone regardless of ethnicity. Yet they said minorities are so poor and so disenfranchised that they live in rural communities failing to recognize that it's highly unprofitable to set up expensive infrastructure in these communities. In contrast, our world gave you a clear trade-off from the get-go. Even if they could prove that corporations run these services better, they don't prove that this is an important outcome because it comes with economic trade-offs that only states can account for through the vote. They can decide in the middle of a healthcare crisis to charge more for airline tickets if it meant better treatments for patients when they have more money. They could lower water prices charged by state-owned enterprises to increase industrial production in factories. Additionally, our world was nuanced and spectrumized from the start. We gave you reasons why states across the board, regardless of whether they were democratic or authoritarian, had better incentives to care about societal welfare. All democracies are forced to limit prices because unaffordable water is a surefire way to anger everyone. Even in authoritarian regimes, states still needed to maintain performance legitimacy because rolling back democratic protections is predicated on you improving standards of living. So we engaged on the full spectrum and breadth of this debate. For all those reasons, very proud to stand on opposition. Thank you. Judges all set. Excellent. We thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the reply speaker in proposition to close this debate up for us. I think opposition forgets time. I think opposition forgets time and time again that this isn't an imaginary debate. This debate takes place in the status quo which is why it was important for them to look at what developing countries we are talking about right now look like. And I think it was damning for their case to overlook this. It's going to cost them the debate. Like they can't say we have examples too. murmur for a couple of seconds and then give a name of a developed country. Like, come on. Firstly, let's talk about economic efficiency. And insofar as they don't negate the importance of this claim, all they do is mitigate why it is not true. The core of their claim in this response is, well, first of all, they cherry pick one of our analysis in our first argument that companies can't enter the industry, so there's no competition. Other than the fact that they don't respond to our shareholder analysis and why the incentives of companies and governments are different when that is a good thing, we give you a list of reasons as to why this is non-response. Number one, their first speaker makes a really big point at the beginning of the debate and makes fun of us in their setup and says that industries, these are industries where materials are already there. So obviously, by their own claim, the barrier of entry isn't that high. Second, when they realize they messed up, they say, oh, oh, oh but what about like electric companies? That's hard to enter, right? But we told you, like five different developing countries did privatize their electronic manufacturing industry and saw massive improvements in efficiency for all these structural reasons of efficiency, of privatization we told you about. Know how we still don't get a response to the end of the debate. And even in our worst case, note that these companies don't need to be massive national markets. It can be regional as well. The fact is, individuals can enter the market on our side. We think that is a good thing, opposed to the entirety of it being state-owned. Three, even if all of this is not true, note that we're not like recreating these industries on our side. Privatization means taking the state-owned enterprises and making it private, right? As we told you. So in our worst case, even if it is true that this is a monopoly, which I think is massively unlikely, to happen since corporations can always emerge and have market incentives to compete with each other we get the benefits of privatization for that industry anyway besides uh, like so we think that is a good thing for 
they still have no response to the num numerous reasons we gave you as to why the government is a bad actor. Then for some reason, the vote is the mechanism and they make this like debate of like democracy versus companies. This is a super weird clash, first of all, because number one, a lot of developing countries, like they say, are authoritarian. And even if they're democratic, they have super weak democracies. So it is unclear to me why this was their silver bullet in the debate. But moreover, presumably, people can vote on our side as well. Like, why can't governments benefit private companies? And Lauren asked them this. Like, the previous speaker doesn't respond. Governments have investment projects in the private sector. It's not like the government can't touch the company unless it's explicitly state-owned. So a lot of their impacts were imaginary. But also note, Opposition has debated the entirety of this debate, and they just assume that politicians in these countries are angels, and that if the public wants anything, they'll rush to give it to them. Number one, this is the issue with ignoring our, our second argument, because we told you what the characterization of governments actually are. They're ridden with corruption and cronyism. That's a very unrealistic representation of what these developing countries' governments look like. But secondly, they do not remember politicians are the beneficiaries of SOEs, so they have no incentive whatsoever to just listen to the public every time you have a vote. They want to maximize their own profits as well. We told you governments have their own incentives. We told you why the government was inherently oppositional to uh, opposition to efficiency insofar as they're precisely short termists, as they point out, which means that they don't have any incentive to invest in the long term because it means that the party in the future will take will reap the benefits of, uh, will reap the benefits of that investment, so they're unlikely to do to do that. At the end of the debate, their word is extremely uncomparative. They haven't engaged in what the actual characterization of the debate was. And for these reasons, we're happy to propose. Thank you for that speech and for the debate as a whole. Uh, congratulations for making it through all the preliminary rounds. Uh, and uh, we will retire. I will stop the recording. For